Well, hey everybody, good morning and welcome to Lake Oconee Church. If we haven't met yet, my name is Andy, I'm on staff here and I'm so glad that you're here. Congratulations on successfully navigating the time change uh, unless you're just late for the last service. Is that how that works? I'm always confused uh, which way the clock goes, but I'm glad that you're here and a part of this morning. And this Sunday is Selection Sunday for college basketball. So we thought we would play a little March Madness minute uh, of our own with a game called Know It or Throw It. So uh, I'm going to invite our contestant to the stage. Meredith, if you would uh, come on up here. This is Meredith Caps. Put your hands together for Meredith, if you would. Well, thank you for being willing to play. And uh, there's something in this for you. There's actually a really good prize, but I'll tell you about that in a second. Here's your microphone. And uh, Meredith is one of our uh, family ministry volunteers. She volunteers in Upstreet. Uh, and so she's going to be playing this game with us. But here's the good news. Um, it's, it's a fairly simple game. How knowledgeable are you about uh, NCAA basketball? I'm not sure. Not sure. <laughs> I, think That's, I'm, I think I'm knowledgeable. But th we'll that find is out. a trick question, right? So, <laughs> so, so it, here's the good news. Okay. You've got a 50-50 chance on every question uh, because I'm going to give you two answers. You just have to choose between them. But here's the good news for you. In the seats, you also have a 50-50 chance for each question as well. So here's how the game works. Um, for each question, you're going to pick up a basketball then I'm going to ask you the question with two answers, you pick one. If you get it right, you drop the ball in your bucket. If you get it wrong, you're gonna send that ball out into the seats. And whoever gets that ball, well, they get a gift card uh, and uh, they can claim that gift card after the service. Okay. For every ball that's in your bucket, you get a gift card, and these are $5 Chick-fil-A gift cards, so you could feed your family for uh, a whole meal. Uh, we were going to go with gas cards, and apparently those are unavailable, so I don't know what to do about that. So, uh, so you'll, uh, you, for every question, grab a ball, uh, and then you'll either toss it to the crowd or put it in your bucket, depending on your answer, okay? okay? Now, we've got 10 questions, but only two minutes to answer them in, so you're going to have to go pretty quick, all right? Are you ready? Grab a ball or wait till you ask? Uh, you can grab a ball and I'll ask the first okay. question. You ready? Yes, Set, sir. go. What team won the first NCAA basketball national championship tournament? Was it Villanova or Oregon? Villanova. Eh. What sportscaster first called the NCAA tournament March Madness? Was it Brent Musburger or Jim Nance? Musburger. That is correct. Uh, <laughs> what is the traditional March Madness anthem? Is it One Shining Moment or Don't Stop Believing? Oh, I don't know. One Shining Moment. That is correct. <laughs> what player Sorry. is the NCAA tournament's all-time leading scorer? Is it Oscar Robertson or Christian Leitner? Leitner. It is Leitner. That is correct. <laughs> Number five, what are the odds of filling out a perfect March Madness bracket? Is it one in 9.2 billion or one in 9.2 quintillion? Let's go with billion. And, sorry, oh. quintillion, yes. Um, who is the first number 16 seed to upset a number one seed? Is it University of Maryland, Baltimore County, or Villanova? Villanova. I'm sorry, it's uh, the other one. The other one. Uh, which team won both their semifinal and championship games in triple overtime to take the title in 1957? Was it North Carolina or Duke? North Carolina. Yeah, that's correct. Yes, How yes. old was the youngest head coach to win March Madness? Was it 36 or 31? 36. I'm sorry, 31. Question nine, which player Terrible. sank the game-winning shot that gave Dean Smith his first NCAA title as a head coach? Was it Michael Jordan or Patrick Ewing? Michael Jordan. That is correct. Like that Question 10, what is the fewest points ever scored by a team in an NCAA tournament game? Was it 31 or 20? 31. I'm sorry, it was 20. But you did get it in within the time. There's five seconds left on the clock. Good job. Everybody right, give sorry. her a hand. <laughs> and you have one, two, three, four, five, which means 
I have one, two, three, four, five Chick-fil-A gift cards for you and your family. Congratulations. Everybody give Meredith a hand if you would. Well done, well done. And for those of you with a basketball in your hands at present, uh, after the service, if you'll head to the studio, uh, you can trade that out for one of these $5 gift cards, uh, also to Chick-fil-A. So you'll definitely want to do that after the service. And for those of you who are our guest, I, I may not have a Chick-fil-A gift card for you, but I do have another gift for you that our guest service team has put together uh, just as a way of saying thank you for being a part of our service. And so after the service this morning, swing by the studio, that's that glass classroom you passed on the way in, uh, and you can pick up that gift quickly as you head out the door. But thank you for being a part of our service this morning. And if you're our guest online, you can go to guest.lakeoconee.church, and we'll email you something kind of cool as well. Well, as we head into the next hour, hour and five minutes or so, uh, we're going to sing a couple of songs together, led by Tan Smith and Mel Washington and our band. Uh, and I'd love for you to, to join in as soon as you're comfortable doing that. And you can find the words to those songs. They'll be right there on the screen in front of you. Uh, and then we'll jump into this morning's message. Uh, so if you would, stand to your feet, say hey to somebody nearby, and we'll keep this morning going.
given. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Cause the God I serve knows only how to try us.
Hey, thanks so much for singing with us. We'll invite you to grab your seats. You keep hope alive. What an encouraging reminder. And I don't know exactly what it is that you may be going through this week. For some of you, it's dealing with a a difficult diagnosis. And for others of us, it's navigating just a complex relationship. For others, it's something huge that you're grappling with at work right now. And for others, it's trying to figure out how to be the best mom and the best dad or best grandparents that you can possibly be for the children that are in your world. Uh, for others, you're grieving the, the, the passing of someone that you love so deeply and miss so significantly. And there's so many different moments in our lives And the reminder that because of Jesus' resurrection, that there is hope, that could be life-changing. And I hope that as we go through this morning, that you will be reminded of that confidence that we can have in Jesus. And we're going to dive into that discussion here in just a minute. But I want to pause for just a second to remind you that as a church, we exist to inspire people to follow that Jesus that brings hope. And for any of you who are involved in in giving towards our mission, that mission of inspiring people to follow Jesus, whether you use the buckets that are in the back or our Lake Oconee Church app, or you go online at give.lakeoconee.church, however you choose to do that, thank you, thank you, thank you for being involved in sharing that hope with our community. Uh, It's so significant, and I'm grateful that you do. 
In a minute, we're going to dive into our message and explore a little bit more about that hope. But we have an opportunity as we head towards Easter to demonstrate that hope. And so as each of us leave this morning, we'll have the opportunity uh, to get one of these shopping bags. Uh, And attached to the bag is a shopping list. And this list describes how you can buy the supplies needed to build an Easter uh, basket, an Easter basket for foster families that are in our counties, in Georgia's Lake Country. So at the top, there's for a young child and uh, in the, uh, at the bottom for an older child. Uh, and as you buy the supplies for those Easter baskets and return these bags this coming Sunday and the following Sunday, some of our small groups are going to build those Easter baskets so that they can be delivered to children that are in foster care within Georgia's Lake Country. So I hope that you'll take a step as you leave today, grab this bag and shop off this list and then return those bags over the next couple of Sundays so that you can be a part of really bringing hope to a child uh, at Easter time and not only demonstrating that you care about them, but that they are loved by their heavenly father as well. And that's kind of the whole heart behind Love in the Lake Country is demonstrating the love of our heavenly father throughout our community. Well, in just a minute, we're gonna connect with this morning's message. And around here, we're very serious about putting the most engaging presenters in front of you from week to week. So sometimes they're live on our stage and sometimes they're live from a nearby campus. And this morning, we're gonna be hearing from Andy Stanley. He's live just up the road in Alpharetta today. And he's bringing us part two of our series entitled Investigating Jesus. And this is a series that will continue all the way till Easter as we look for uh, the answers to some of our doubts. If you came into the room with questions and doubts and for others who may have come into the room with great confidence and great beliefs, um, he's providing some explanation that supports some of those beliefs, some of that big faith that so many of us practice and exercise. But we don't want this to simply be a Sunday only thing. So over the next five weeks on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, we're going to be sending uh, just a quick text with a brief devotional that goes along with this series. And I'd love for you to be able to receive those. And to do that, you simply have to go to luke.lakeoconee.church and we'll uh, connect you with that list. If you go to that website, you can sign up really quickly at luke.lakeoconee.church and those begin tomorrow. So I hope that you'll jump in and be a part of that. Well, with everything going on in our world and in our lives, I'd love the chance to pray for us. So let's take a minute to do that. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you that you do keep hope alive because of Jesus. And God, as Andy unpacks why and how we can believe in Jesus. God, I pray that for those of us who are doubting and asking questions and grappling with some things for some of us for years, God, I pray that in these moments that you would allow us to see some glimpses of who you are, that your word would build faith in us uh, as we uh, begin to take faltering steps towards following you. And for others of us, God, I pray that you would give us the answers and explanations, maybe in a different way than we've ever explained it before, uh, to why the hope that we have is so real. And God, as we look at the complicated parts of our everyday lives, God, I pray for those who are are grieving today. I pray for those who are just at their wits end. I pray for those who aren't certain that they can jump into another week of those same obligations and tensions. And God, I pray that you would bring hope. And God, in the name of Jesus, we are so grateful. And we pray these prayers knowing that he is our risen Savior. And thank you for him. And it's in his name that we pray.
So um, here's something to think about. Don't answer out loud and um, don't elbow anyone. And anyway, if, you're, if your life is a commercial, what are you advertising? I know. If your life is a commercial, what are you advertising? Because I think we're all advertising something, right? If your life is a commercial, I mean, just sort of a general, you know, when people, when you come to mind and people kind of give the, oh yeah, I know, you know, I know, you know, I know her, she's, I know him, I, I've met him. What, what, if your life is a commercial, what is your life advertising? And I don't necessarily recommend that you ask someone else what they think your life. I mean, maybe if you're very secure or you're with the right people, but just, it's just something to think about. More on that in just a minute. Today, we are in part two, as some of you know, of our series on the book of Luke entitled, Investigating Jesus, How We Know and Why We Follow. Investigating Jesus, how we know, how we know that Jesus is who Jesus claimed he was and why in the world would we follow um, Jesus? And these are very, very important questions because the Christian faith, and we, just, we talked a lot about this last time in part one, the Christian faith really rises and falls on the identity of a single individual. The, the, the Christian faith doesn't rise and fall necessarily on the infallibility of the entire Bible, although I read the Bible every single day and love it and teach from it every single weekend. But Christianity specifically doesn't rise and fall on the infallibility of the Bible. The truth is the Christian faith actually rises and falls on the identity of one single individual, Jesus of Nazareth. So when it comes to the veracity of Christianity, when it comes to the truthfulness or the trustworthiness of the Christian faith, the question to wrestle with, and this is why we're talking about this, the question to wrestle with um, is not, is there a God? Although it's fun to talk about, is there a God and all the proofs of God and what science says? I mean, that's fascinating. I love reading those books, but that's not really the issue when it comes to Christianity. Neither is it, is the entire Bible true? The question to wrestle to the ground with when it comes to Christianity, and the reason this is so important for some of us is if you're in a season of life and you've always considered yourself a Christian or you were raised as a Christian and you're losing your faith, it's just kind of slipping away or you're kind of leaning for the door or maybe you've, if you're honest, you'd say you lost your faith or maybe you're in the process of, you know, the, the common, the phrase that we're using now is deconstructing your faith. Before you give up on faith or walk away from faith or before you decide, you know what, I just don't think I believe it anymore. The question is, the real issue is when it comes to not theism, but Christianity specifically is this. Is Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John a reliable account of actual events? This is what Christianity really comes down to. Is any one of these four accounts of the life of Jesus, we call these the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, these four first century documents that were created and collected and copied and eventually were, became part of what we call the Bible, the B-I-B-L-E. But long before there was the Bible, there were these four ancient documents. And the question the, when it comes to Christianity is this, are any, are any one of these, much less all four of these, are any one of these a reliable account of actual events? Because if they are, then what they say about Jesus is true. And if what they say about Jesus is true, regardless of what you think about everything else in the world and everything else in the Bible, if what they say about Jesus is true, then you need to sit up straight. We need to sit up straight and pay attention, right? So in this series, we are exploring one of these ancient documents. We call it the book of Luke or the gospel of Luke. It's named for its author. And right up front, as we discovered last time, right up front, Luke tells us what he's up to. Right up front, Luke tells us why he took the time to give an account or write an account of the life of Jesus of Nazareth. And here's what he says. This is the introduction to the gospel of Luke. I'll read this quickly because we spent a lot of time on this last time. <clears throat> Luke begins this way. He says, many, I'm not the only one. I'm not the only one because something extraordinary happened and a lot of people are trying to document this for the next generation. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled or the things that happened among us. Not a long, long time ago. He's, this happened within his lifetime. Just as they were handed down to us by those who were from the first, eyewitnesses and servants of the word, referring to Jesus. With this in mind, he says, with this in mind, I myself have carefully investigated. 
In other words, I, I didn't you know, write from memory, but I carefully investigated. I talked to these eyewitnesses, everything from the beginning. And I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent the Theophilus. And we said last time Theophilus was a, an early Christian, a first century Christian who was curious and no doubt had heard stories about Jesus, but was trying to piece this whole thing together. And he apparently said to Luke, Luke, we need somebody like you. Luke was a doctor. We need somebody to get all this down in order. So would you please investigate this and let's create an orderly account so that this generation and the next would know what happened right here in our midst. And Luke wants to provide him with reliable answers. Now, the important thing to understand is this. Luke, and this is hard for us because of how we got our Bible or how the Bible was presented to us. Luke is not writing religious literature. Luke, as we said last time and explained last time, Luke is not writing the Bible. Luke has never heard of the Bible. In Luke's lifetime, there would never be a, the Bible. That was like 300 years later, the, the assembly of the first Bible. Luke isn't writing religious literature. He's not writing the Bible. He's documenting someone's life. He's telling someone's story and a story that took place in his lifetime. And what we discover in the gospel of Luke and the book of Acts is this, that Luke who wrote this actually knew Peter, Jesus' famous fisherman follower. Jesus, Luke actually knew James, the brother of Jesus. Luke actually knew the apostle Paul that wrote almost half the New Testament. That Luke knew these people, interviewed these people, traveled with these people, and then gave us and brought us this orderly account of the life of Jesus. And then he adds this. And the reason I wrote this is so that you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. So Theophilus, the person he wrote this for, is kind of like us. Theophilus believed, but he had questions. Theophilus believed and had become a Jesus follower, but he's like, okay, is this, is this anchored in reality or is this just faith and faith and faith and stories? And Luke is saying, no, I want you to know the certainty. I want you to, I, I wrote this so that you can be assured that what you believe is actually anchored to something that actually happened. Isn't that amazing? So jumping right in, three chapters in, Luke introduces us to Jesus' warm-up act, Jesus' pregame show. Does anybody know who the warm-up act was for Jesus? Anybody know? John the Baptist, right? Or actually, literally, it's John the Baptizer. But as we jump into this part of Luke's account, I wanna slow down once again, and I want to read to you how Luke introduces this section of his documentation of the life of Jesus. It doesn't, begin, it doesn't sound like once upon a time. It doesn't sound like, you know, in a galaxy far, far away or in a world far, far away or once upon a time during the time of the Romans. Listen to how he introduces this. It reads like history because it is. And the reason he is so specific is because Luke is inviting his readers to fact check him. Listen to how this starts. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, not during the Romans or even during the reign of Tiberius Caesar. He's like, no, I want you to know exactly when this happened. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Tiberius Caesar was um, Caesar Augustus' adopted son. When Pontius Pilate was the governor of Judea, a very narrow slice of time, and Herod, of the Herod Tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, Tetrarch of Ituria and Trachonitis, and Licinius, Tetrarch of Abilene. When you get to these parts of the Bible, if you read the Bible, you just kind of blitz on through it. Like, what's that? Why is that important? Here's why it's important. Because Luke is writing history and he wants his readers to put a pen right in the period of time when what he's about to describe happened. Just a little heads up. If you are writing fiction, you never do this. If you are trying to pass something off that's fiction as something that's true, you never do this because it makes it too easy to fact check. And Luke is saying, no, no, I thoroughly investigated all of this. What I'm about to tell you isn't a Bible story. It's not a religious story. This is what happened. It reads like history, 
because it is. He continues, he says this, the word of God during this time came to John, the son of Zechariah in the wilderness. Now, the reason he didn't just say John is because in this period of time, if you've read the New Testament, every third man is named John or something John. If there's so many Johns, it's confusing. Why are so many people named John in the New Testament? Did you know the answer to that question is actually extraordinary evidence for the authenticity of the gospels? The reason so many people, men were named John during this period of time is because of the story of the Maccabees. And if you don't know the story of the Maccabees, it's amazing. But the, one of the greatest pieces of evidence for the authenticity and the reliability of the gospels are the names used in the gospels. But we don't have time to talk about that today. So he introduces us to John, son of Zebedee, John, son of Zechariah in the wilderness. And this is the famous John the Baptist. Now, how famous was John the Baptist? Here's how famous John the Baptist was. Every once in a while, you'll hear me reference Josephus, or you've heard of Josephus. Josephus was a Jewish, not a Christian, Jewish historian who wrote around his, he wrote several big, massive documents, the Jewish wars, the antiquities of the Jews, and one other giant one. Um, and he wrote around 90 AD after the destruction of, of the temple in Jerusalem. And one of his most famous writings, you can get it cheap, you can get it on Amazon if you wanna read the history of the Jews or the Jewish wars, I would, I would encourage you to read the Jewish wars first. In, in the antiquities of, of the Jews, he writes his own history of the Jews. And when he gets to the period of history where he's telling the story of Herod the Great and the family of Herod and the sons of Herod, when he tells that part of the story, he talks about John the Baptist. Now, why in the world would Josephus talk about John the Baptist? Because when he got to that period of history, John the Baptist was such a big deal, he couldn't tell the whole story without referring to John the Baptist. And here's what he says about John the Baptist. I'll give you the story and then I'm gonna read you something Josephus wrote because it's kind of interesting. Here's what happened. According to, his, according to actually the gospel writers and Josephus, um, John the Baptist became famous um, because Herod Antipas, who was Herod the Great's son, Herod the Great was the one who had all the children killed in Bethlehem. Herod the Great's son, Herod Antipas, um, decided <laughs> to, this is, this is sort of a paraphrase of what Josephus wrote, to, to gently and quietly divorce his wife. Gently and quietly divorce his wife. No, that didn't work then. That doesn't work now. You don't gently and quietly divorce your wife. And it was even worse because he wanted to gently and quietly divorce his wife so he could marry his brother's wife. Okay. Well, his wife that he was going to try to gently and quietly divorce, she wasn't having it. And she ran to daddy and her daddy was a king. He was a, an Arab king. His name was King um, Eratos or Eratus. Um, and so he was so offended by the fact that Herod Antipas was going to divorce his daughter. He declares war on Herod Antipas and they go to war over that. And one other um, thing that had to do with some property and some boundaries. And this king, this, his Herod's um, about to be ex-wife's father defeats Herod in battle. I mean, it's a major, major defeat. So this is the context because Josephus is telling the story of Herod Antipas and he gets to the story. He has to tell the story of John the Baptist. So here's what Josephus writes about John the Baptist. Now, here's why I'm reading this to you because I want you to understand. And again, for those of you that you, you just think, well, Jesus is a Bible story. It's all Bible stories. No, this is history. These people actually live. So here's what Josephus writes about John the Baptist. This is, he's writing about 60 years after his death, but Luke references John the Baptist within a few years of his death. But here's what Josephus writes. Now, some of the Jews thought that the, the destruction of Herod's army because of this battle came from God and was a very just punishment against Herod Antipas for what he did against John called the Baptist. For Herod Antipas had John the Baptist killed, although he was a good man. And John the Baptist had urged the Jews to exert themselves to virtue, both as to justice toward one another and reverence towards God. So John the Baptist actually created such a stir in that part of the world that when Josephus, the historian, tells this part of the Jewish history, he has to include John the Baptist. So this isn't somebody that Luke just made up. This is an extraordinary person who caused a ripple in the Judean desert and in parts of Galilee because of his teaching. So back to Luke, here's what Luke says. 
The word of God, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah in the wilderness. And he, John the Baptist, went into all the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. The reason he was called John the baptizer, he's the only person, the first person in history that we know of that actually took somebody by the hands or the neck and actually baptized them. Before that, you baptized yourself as part of a ceremonial washing, but this was part of his rep reputation. And the thing he connected with this baptism was not church membership because there was no such thing as the church. He, what was associated with his baptism was a baptism of repentance. If you allowed John the Baptist to baptize you, you were saying, I'm repenting of my sin and I'm gonna live a better life. But the specific reason John the Baptist came was to get people ready for the main act, Jesus of Nazareth. And his message was this, as we're gonna see, God's about to do something new. God's about to do something new. God's about to do something new and you don't wanna miss it. So update your firmware or you're gonna miss it. And he was so direct. In fact, one day he's preaching and the Pharisees and teachers of the law come from Jerusalem and where he's baptizing is a long ways away from Jerusalem. It would take at least or more than a day just to get from Jerusalem to where he was. So they make this long journey. He sees them coming <clears throat> and he was very direct. You remember this part. He looks up, he stops what he's doing. He looks up at the Pharisees and teachers of the law and he says, welcome, <laughs> you brood of vipers. You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the, it's about to get here, here it comes, here it comes, the coming wrath. And then he goes on to basically say this, hey guys, don't come down here just to check a box. This isn't about checking a box. Don't come down here and say, oh yeah, you remember John the Baptist? I was baptized by John. Put a check in the box. He says, no, 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 we're not doing that. And don't come down here and try to you know, justify yourself um, you know, by finding fault with my theology. Don't come down here and listen to me preach and then go home and say, oh yeah, we want to hear that guy. He's crazy. He said, no, I know what you're thinking already. You are to produce fruit in keeping with repentance. I want you to walk your talk. You gotta put some wheels on it. You need to be doers of, not just respecters of the Torah. Because the days, the days of reducing religion to tradition, the days of an internalized religion where you can live with the, the theory that you're right with God because of something on the inside that never manifests itself on the outside, those days are over. It's time for you to do something. And then he addresses what they're thinking. <clears throat> and then he addresses, to be honest, what some of us are thinking when you hear a sermon like this. And do not be, he just read their minds. He knew what they were thinking. And do not begin to say to yourselves, do not comfort yourself with, don't try to hide behind. But we have Abraham as our father. We are sons and daughters of Abraham. We have checked the big box. We are good to go. That's enough, right? To be a son and a daughter of Abraham. And he says, no, 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 don't, don't even pretend, don't hide behind that. For I tell you, and I'm telling you, what he said next was so offensive. For I tell you, for I tell you, <clears throat> God, for out of these stones, God can raise up children of Abraham. For out of these stones, God can raise up children of Abraham. Which got me thinking, <clears throat> And I'm just making this part up. So if this is, if you don't like this, that's okay, you can discount this. I wonder what John the Baptist would say to us, what he would say to me. What John the Baptist would say to us comfortable, consumer-oriented Christians, the what's in it for me, Christians, the, 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 those of us who have reduced Christian faith and faith to just, hey, as long as I confess my sins and I'm good with God, I'm good to go. Marginally committed believers. <clears throat> I think he might say something like this. And do not say to yourselves, but I'm a Christian. This isn't for me, I'm good to go. I prayed a sinner's prayer. I've asked Jesus into my heart. I've asked Jesus to be my savior. I'm good to go, right? I mean, that, that, that's all that's required. And I think John the Baptist would lean in and say, for I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up Christians. That's disturbing, isn't it? That was his point. His point was to disturb people out of their apathy, to disturb people out of their, but I believe all the right things and I'm related to the right people. He reminded them. This is why I asked the question at the beginning. John was reminding his audience 
And Jesus is going to come along and remind us, his followers, of the same thing. He was reminding them that their lives were supposed, he reminded them of what their lives were supposed to be advertising. He's reminding us of what our lifestyles and our actions are supposed to be advertising. He's shaking those of us up who have made religion a tradition, even our Christian religion, something that's just become a tradition. He's speaking to those of us who have so internalized our faith that we have convinced ourselves we're fine because of what we believe, regardless of what we do and aren't willing to do. Because this message was you are to produce fruit. You are to produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Or our Christian version would go something like this. You are to produce fruit in keeping with what you say you believe and who you claim to believe And if that's a little bit unsettling, you understand. It's unsettling to me. And if it if it makes you want, if it makes you want to find a kinder, gentler preacher than John the Baptist, right? If you if you want, and I get this, and I think maybe most Christians fall into this category. Not you, y'all are all special, but I'm saying, you know, most Christians fall into the category of just give me a little bit more comfort and a little less requirement, and I'll be fine. Just give me a little bit more comfort and a little less requirement and I'll be fine. But the interesting thing is John was not discounting the value of being related to Abraham. His point was, that's not the point. In other words, being related to Abraham, that's not a finish line, he was saying to them. That's actually the starting line. And he says the very same thing to us throughout the book of Luke as he begins to unfold the ministry and the teaching of Jesus. Luke makes it so clear that discovering who Jesus is and placing our faith in Jesus as Messiah or Jesus as Savior, that's not the finish line. That's actually the starting line. And John's point in his in his particular environment or his uh, immediate context was simply this: God is about to do something new, and I don't want you to miss it. God is about to unleash something new on the world, and I don't want you to miss it. And the only way to ensure that you're not missing it is to get your heart and your lifestyle in sync with God, because this new thing that God's about to do is going to be fueled by, animated by, characterized by. Not simply believing, doing for others. Because internalized, vertical religion only was out. Now, we, this is so fascinating. We know that John the Baptist's uh, original audience got the message. And we know they got the message because of the question they ask. They ask a question that we should all ask. And when I began putting this message together several weeks ago, and I bumped into this question, it was so convicting to me. And I knew I was gonna ask you to ask the question, so I began asking the question, and it kind of goes along with a prayer that I pray every single day, but it kind of took it up a notch. Because this is a this is a powerful question. In fact, I'm not exaggerating, I don't think I'm exaggerating if I said this. If just Christians would begin to ask and answer and act on this question, if just the people in our churches and our city would begin to ask and answer and act on this question, things would change. Families would change, communities would change. A whole nation could change. And if you don't, well, let me kind of prod a little bit before I tell you what the question is. If you're losing faith, part of the reason you're losing faith is you haven't asked this question and acted on this question. In fact, if you've lost faith, here's my hunch. Whatever Christian community or faith community you grew up in, they didn't ask you to ask this question or confront you with this question enough. So consequently, consequently, your faith became stagnant. Your faith became stagnant. Your faith became a little bit lifeless. And then after a while, it just died because, look up here. When you internalize Christianity and it is mostly internalized and rarely externalized, you are in a dangerous, dangerous place because you're on the verge of allowing your faith to wither and to die. Here's the question they ask. After John preaches these messages, what should we do then? They ask. What should we do then? The crowd ask. What should we do? Not what should we believe, 
What should we do? What should we do to prepare for the new that God is about to do? What should we do so that our hearts and lives are in sync with God so that when God shows up in this new way, because in a week or a few months, Jesus is gonna step onto the banks of the Jordan River and there's that epic moment, you know, when John is about to baptize somebody and he stops and he looks up and he's like, oh my goodness, everybody, look, behold, it's begun. The Lamb of God, he knows they are weeks, maybe hours, days away from that. And he's like, in order for you to recognize the new that God is about to do, you have to get not just your hearts, but your lifestyle in sync with God. What should we do, they ask. And his answer is so simple. And his answer is so simplistic. His answer is so un and non-religious that it shocked them, just like it's gonna shock us. What should we do? He said, well, Here's what you should do. Anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none. Wait, what? Share? Yeah, share. Okay, John, that's not very religious. Uh, Heck, you can do that anywhere. I mean, I don't even have to go to the temple to do that. John's like, that's my point. If you have something that someone else needs, you share. And if anybody who, if anybody who has, if you, anyone who has food, should do the same. Now, food was rare and you know, food was scarce sometimes, hard to transport, it didn't last very long. He's like, if you have something extra that somebody needs, you share. And they're like, okay, wait, wait, what? Yeah, if you, have, if you see a need you can meet, you meet it. Well, wait, what does this have to do with repent and acts of repentance? He's going, it has everything to do with that because you are on the verge. We are on the verge. The world is on the verge of God doing that very same thing for all mankind. God sees a need that mankind and womankind cannot meet and he is about to meet it. And if you wanna recognize the work and the activity of God, then you've gotta get to work and you've gotta get active doing the work of God. So you should do for others what others can't do for themselves because God is about to do for the world what the world can't do for itself. The tax gatherers are like, well, what should, what should we do? And everybody was sorry. They're like, well, first of all, you shouldn't even be here because we are, you are the most despised group. But somehow even the tax gatherers had come to hear John preach. What should we, what should we do? And John says, I'll tell you what you should do. It's real simple, it's so practical. Don't collect any more than you're required to. How about that for a start? Quit, quit using your power and your position to steal from people. And don't simply settle for legal and don't simply settle for permissible. Everybody knows it's permissible for you to overcharge people their taxes so that you enrich yourself. We know that standard operating procedure, but if you're gonna get your heart right with God, you've got to do differently. You've got to do something notable and noble and noteworthy. You've got to do something that's so noticeable that people stop and stare and say, what's going on? In other words, he says, don't don't just do what you can, do what's just. Don't just do what you can get by with. Don't just do what you can justify. And then another group came to John the Baptist, soldiers. Now, let me tell you about these soldiers. These are not Roman soldiers. These are soldiers that work for Rome, but they're not Roman citizens. They're not even from Italy. They've never been to Rome. These are what were called auxiliaries. These were men that had been recruited from the surrounding regions by Rome to serve Rome as soldiers and as guards. And there was so much racism going on. These were groups that pretty much hated Galileans and Judeans and the Galileans and Judeans hated them as well. And yet Rome imported them into Galilee and Judea to work for Rome. So it wasn't simply that Rome had their heel on the neck of the Judeans and Galileans. These were soldiers they had imported. There was already hatred between these groups. There was so much animosity, but yet they're so moved by John the Baptist's message. And they say, okay, well, what should we do? And John says, it's so simple. Don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely and be content with your pay. Stop taking from, stop stealing from people. I know it's how you enrich yourself. I know every other soldier does it. I know it's the way of the world. But if you want to recognize the activity of God, stop it and quit accusing people falsely and using your power in order to enrich yourself. Don't power up on the powerless. Instead, 
You use your power to protect and support the powerless because the day is coming when God is going to send his son into the world to do that very thing for you. For even the son of man will not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So use your power to protect the powerless. This was so upside down. It was so backwards. It was so unheard of. It was so refreshing. In fact, it was so powerful. And John was such a powerful communicator that his audience began to wonder. This was the rumor that maybe he's the Messiah. Maybe he's the Messiah. We've never heard words like this before. We've never heard of a value system like this before. Imagine, imagine if everyone embraced this way of thinking and living. Imagine what would happen in our communities they're thinking to themselves. And John catches wind of the fact that they think he's the one, the Messiah. And he says in so many words, are you kidding? Not even close. We're just getting started. I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful. You think my words are powerful? You just wait. One more powerful than I will come. The straps of whose sandals I am not even worthy to untie, which meant I'm not even will, I'm not even worthy to be his servant, much less his follower or his disciple. So get ready. Get ready, get ready, he says, and get the world ready. Go do something, something noticeable, something notable, something noteworthy, something stop and stare, something, are you kidding, who does that? Which brings me back to us, which brings me back to those of us who consider ourselves Christian. If my life, if our lives, if, if your life is a commercial, what are you advertising? If your life is a commercial, what are you advertising? Normal? This is how everybody else does it. This is how everybody else lives. This is how everybody else consumes. This is how, every, this is how generous everybody else is. This is what's expected. What version, what version of faith are you advertising? The internal vertical version of the Christian faith the comfortable and the comforting version of the Christian faith, the what can I get out of it and what can I wring out of it and what's in it for me version that requires you to do so very little. It, it, it's unfortunate and sometimes people get confused when I talk about this. It's like, wait a minute, I thought salvation is free and grace is free. Of course, salvation is free and grace is free. But again, this was John's point. That's not the finish line. That's the launch pad. That's the starting point. If you have been a recipient of God's grace and God's goodness and God's forgiveness, then do you know what we should advertise every single day of our lives and every single relationship? Grace and the goodness and the mercy and the generosity and the compassion of God through our different temperaments and our different personalities. And some of us are extroverted, some of us are introverted, you know, all of that's fine. But we should advertise, if we're gonna put wheels on it, it should look like what God, our heavenly father has done for us. That's what we should be advertising. That's what should characterize us. That's what changed the world once. That's what will change the world again. So which version? The normal version of Christianity? It doesn't seem to be making much difference these days. Or the John the Baptist version, which is we're gonna discover was the, was the beginning of the Jesus version, the one another version, the do unto others version, the do for one version, the version that does stuff. So I wanna challenge you, challenge all of us, maybe just for a week, but what a, for me, since I bumped into this, you know, preparing, it's just, it's just become part of my prayer life. I wanna challenge you to ask the question. It's the right question to ask. It prepared them for what and who was coming. It opened their eyes to the fact that God was about to do something new so that they would recognize the new that God was about to do. It ensured that their eyes were wide open, that they wouldn't miss the king. They asked, what should we do? Now, real quick, doing is deep. That's what doing is. 
Doing is deep. Doing, when you decide, God, when you begin to pray, because this is a scary prayer, God, what would you have me do? It isn't, you're gonna be inv- invited to step out into new things, right? Not super sappy, intangible, spiritual things, very practical things. Doing is what deepens our faith because doing is where we discover God's grace and God's mercy because we need it. Doing requires us to wade in. The reason doing is deep is because being deep means being over your head. You know, there's a shallow end of the pool and the deep end of the pool. The deep end of the pool, you can't touch bottom. Deep Christianity is when you can't touch bottom and it has nothing to do with learning and note-taking. It has everything to do with involving your lives in the problems of the world and the people of the world and it's messy it's, it's involving yourselves with people and issues where you can't even solve the problem. Sometimes all we do is just cushion the blow. Doing is when and where you see God at work. It's messy, it's costly, but it's life-changing. It's life-giving, it's joy-infusing. It, it, it's why anytime at any of our churches, you know, when I'm, I get here early, but some, there are volunteers who get here earlier than me. Whenever I walk up to a volunteer and say, thank you, I try to thank every volunteer. I'm so glad y'all wear those cool t-shirts. Thank you, thank you, thank you. 100% of the time, do you know what I hear? I never hear, yeah, I hate doing this, but you know, you gotta serve God, dude. You know, I'm just trying to make, and I never, you know what I hear? It's like, no, Andy, thank you. I love it, I love these kids. I love getting to serve, I love it. There's, it is joy and peace. But at some point along the way, some of us, we, you just have to decide, you know what, whether I can figure it out or not. And I'm not just talking about volunteering the church. I don't know how God's gonna answer that prayer when you say, God, what should I do? What should I do and how do I live in such a way that my life is noticeably, not different for different sake, but noticeably different in such a way that I begin to point in the direction of and draw attention to my Father in heaven. Because if you and I, and I, I run this risk, okay? And this isn't me pointing my fingers. If we become hearers only and note takers only and consumers only, As I said earlier, you're in the danger zone. I'm in the danger zone. Because anytime we get consumed with ourselves, eventually we only have ourselves to show for ourselves and we don't get bigger, we get smaller. And do you know what else gets smaller? Our faith gets smaller because we become cynical and critical. Jesus said this on a different occasion, I'm jumping way ahead. One time Jesus said this and I'll I'll wrap up. This This is so convicting. Whoever does, not believes. Whoever does the will of my father is my brother and my sister. Whoever does the will of my father is my brother and my sister. Whoever does the will of my father is my brother and my sister. So when John's audience said, okay, we get it. What do we do? That was the right question because doing makes the difference and doing draws attention to our Father in heaven and doing changes things. And we should be doers because of what God has done for each one of us. John knew that if his audience would do, if they would do selfless, if they would do others first, if they would do compassion, they would recognize the selfless, compassionate savior that was right around the corner. So I wanna challenge you every day this week to simply pray this prayer. Heavenly Father, what should I do? Heavenly Father, what should I do? In light of all that you've done, what should I do? Let's just say this out loud. Ready, everybody, even if you're watching alone or you're driving, would you say this together, all together, ready? Heavenly Father, what should I do? One more time. Heavenly Father, what should I do? One last time, believers didn't changed the world, the doers did, the followers did. And there's so much in our world that needs to be changed. And we have the ability because we follow the savior that did something for the whole world. The men and women whose lives advertised God's kingdom come, God's will be done. They're the ones that change the world. And those will be the ones that impact and change the communities in our lifetime. So will you ask it, heavenly father, what should I do? Heavenly Father, what should I do? And if you do, your eyes will be open and your heart will be open to what God has next for you. And we will pick up the storyline next time, right there in part three of our series, Investigating Jesus, how we know and why we follow. I'd love to pray for us before we go. Heavenly Father, 
For some of us, we haven't asked that question in a long time. For some of us, we've never asked it. Father, for some of us, we're losing faith because our faith hasn't been active. We haven't been doing anything. We've just been reading and thinking and getting all caught up in our head and our own personal narrative. So give us the courage to ask it and answer it in a way that stuns us, gives us an opportunity to live a faith that's noticeable and notable and show-stopping and causes people to ask why. So wherever this lands with us, Father, give us the wisdom to know what to do and give us the courage to do it, we pray in Jesus' matchless name, amen. Heavenly Father, what should I do? What a powerful question. I hope that you'll ask it during the course of this week. And as you leave today, uh, we're going to give you a, an opportunity to make a small, tiny step in that direction uh, as you walk out with those grocery bags, as you go shopping. Uh, I hope that you'll grab that even as you pray that question. Heavenly Father, what should I do? Before you go, I want to leave you with three questions that you can kind of consider uh, with family and friends or, or maybe with your small group. Uh, but as you consider this message, uh, question one, how has your faith journey been positively and negatively impacted by your encounters with other Christians? Interesting question. Question two, regarding your faith, have you become more of a consumer than an advertiser? If so, why? What needs to change? And question three, where and how, how and where is your faith journey on display? How and where is your faith on display? Some things to think about as you head into this week. I hope you'll have these conversations, but more than anything, the question with your heavenly father, heavenly father, what should I do? If you're our guest, don't forget to swing by the studio and pick up your gift on your way out the door. Thank you for being with us on this chilly morning. If you have a basketball in your hand, you also should stop by the studio, uh, return those and get one of those gift cards. And for all of us, I hope that you'll plan to come back next Sunday as we connect together around this content. And if you haven't already, sign up for the devotional that'll head out uh, three times this week. You can do that at Church. Uh, lakeaconey.church, luke.lakeaconey.church. And I hope that you have a phenomenal week. We'll see you soon. Take care.